So today we shift from the book of Numbers over to the book of Joshua, but we're still staying focused on these two men of good courage, Joshua and Caleb, and that's because they got what we need to get. They understood what it means when God says, let's go. He's not asking, and they understood that. He was directing. This is a command. So when God says we got to do something, we got to get after it, and we got to do it. And so we need to follow after them in our footsteps when God tells us to go make disciples. That's that mission that we read every single week together as a church, because it's a reminder that we need to do this. Hopefully by now it's burned into the canvas of our hearts, and it's kind of like this sandwich of sorts. It's very easy to remember, a literary sandwich. You got the bread on either side, and think of Jesus, the bread of life. And that bread is basically what Jesus does for us. First, he has all authority in heaven and on earth, and he's with us always to the end of the age. And then in the middle, usually in a sandwich, you got kind of like your meat, your cheese, and your lettuce, right? Well, that's three things, and three things that we need to do in the middle of that, right? We go make disciples. We baptize them, and then we teach them all that Jesus commanded. So that's the sandwich I want us all to be remembering, and then we take that sandwich with us out to the tri-state region and beyond. That's that 30-mile radius where we live on our everyday, ordinary lives. And you'll remember that I use this term sandwich instead of sandwich because the phrase sandwich is, refers to only the most holy of sandwiches, the mightiest, the most extraordinary of sandwiches. So you don't just use it on any sandwich, right? That word. So you got to think about that's what that good, great commission does for us is it allows us to go out into this tri-state region and beyond and actually change from an everyday ordinary life to an extraordinary life. So that's the thing we want us to be focused on as we read and study Joshua. Joshua went out and did this. And so we have a ton to learn from him. As Cammie mentioned, we really want to crawl into this story. And as we go through this today, it is my hope that you'll actually see what God is saying to Joshua is the same thing that he's saying to us in 2024. Okay, so how do we get there? Well, let's briefly review. And I know sometimes when I go through these reviews, some of you are like, oh, come on, man, not another review. But here's the thing. I was a college professor for many years, and I know you have to repeat it over and over and over again. And some of you who give me a hard time about it, you're not going to want to do that, because I usually say, okay, then repeat it to me. And then most of you can't do it, and you feel weird about it. So anyway, as we walk through this, use this as a time to remind yourself of all it is that makes up the history of our faith. So all our story here kind of starts out with Abraham where God makes this covenant with him, where he's gonna take his descendants and he's gonna make them as numerous as the stars. And he's gonna give them this amazing land, that place you see up there in Canaan, point four up there. That's the promise that God makes to Abraham. And of course, Abraham's like, wait a second, how can this be? Me and my wife, Sarah, we're old. We don't have any kids. How are we gonna have descendants? Well, of course, God gives them a son named Isaac. Isaac then has twins, Jacob and Esau, And Jacob gets the birthright, and of course, as we learned, Jacob then goes off and has 12 sons from four different women, and those 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what Israel, or what what the descendants of Abraham are all about, those 12 tribes. And that's what we read about all through the Old Testament. Okay, so then these 12 tribes, they end up enslaved in Egypt. That's point A that you see up there. And so God wants to liberate his people in fulfillment of his promise. And so what does he do? He sends these 10 plagues down. He parts the Red Sea. The people of Israel leave. They're able to get through that Red Sea. Then Egypt changes their mind and they pursue him. And then God brings the waters back down on top of Egypt and and basically just eradicates their entire military. So then what does God do? He takes the nation of Israel and he moves them through the desert. And he provides food for them. He provides water for them. This is also the point in which he gives Moses the Ten Commandments in which to guide and direct his people. Israel eventually makes their way over the course of a few years up there to point three, Kadesh Barnea. They send those 12 spies into the Promised Land to check it out, to confirm that it's exactly as God has promised. Those spies, they return after about 40 days and they say, yeah, the land is amazing, but it's full of these giants and these cities appear to be fortified. Now, two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, 
They're of good courage. They're like, let's go right now. God says go, he's with us, let's go. But those 10 other spies, they whip Israel into this frenzy. And all of a sudden, Israel's frightened and they cry out, right? Then they start grumbling and complaining. And God can't stand that. And so here we got this picture of Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb. They're on their knees. They're tearing their clothes. They're pleading with the people of Israel. Come on, God is with us. We can do this. And what do the people of Israel do? They say, you know what? We're just going to stone these guys. And so God is furious. God shows up. His real presence is right there. He stops this attempt to stone these four men of good courage. And what does he do? He's completely irate. He says, I'm going to disinherit these people. And then Moses, being the leader that he is, he intercedes. He prays to God this amazing prayer of faith where he calls on God's glory and he calls on God's reputation. And in so doing, he, God relents. God says, okay, fine. Not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send you out into the desert for 40 years. One year for every day you were on that recon. And all the while, Everybody over the age of 20 is going to die. That's basically what the punishment's going to wind up with. So, at the end of these 40 years, Israel's up at Moab, up there east of the Promised Land, up there at Mount Nebo, as you see up there on the graphic, where Moses is finally able to look out across the Promised Land, but it's as close as he's ever going to get. Because God then tells Moses to now commission Joshua. And this isn't how God describes Joshua, a man in whom is the Spirit. And so Joshua is going to be commissioned to lead the sons and daughters of Israel to conquer these giants that their parents were so afraid of. So Moses lays his hands on Joshua in front of the priests and all of Israel, and he transfers the leadership role. And that's where we pick up our story today. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, The Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. So this is one of those major inflection points that we find in Scripture. This man, Moses, one of the biggest figures in the entirety of the Old Testament, a servant of the Lord, he's dead. The man who led Israel out of Egyptian captivity. The man who raised his staff and God parted those waters so Israel could get away. Think about this man who met with God on the mountain and brought down those stone tablets that were containing the law. The man who wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The man who pleaded time and time again with God to have mercy on Israel despite their continual acts of rebellion. The man who was not permitted to enter the promised land because he'd broken faith with God. You'll recall when Israel's back at Meribah, there was no water, and Israel's grumbling and complaining like they always did. And God told Moses to speak to a rock to bring forth water. But Moses was so furious at Israel that in his anger, he actually grabbed his staff and he smacked the rock instead. God still brought forth water, but he did not permit Moses to enter into the promised land because of his disobedience. So at the ripe old age of 120 years old, Moses dies on Mount Nebo, never setting foot on the west side of the Jordan. And now Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, assumes command. So God starts by giving Joshua his marching orders. He says, now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. Now, as we've learned, whenever we see an order anywhere in Scripture, we want to look for the action verb, because that tells us what it is that we need to do. And once again, we see that Joshua is to go, to go into the land, to cross over this Jordan. The last time God said, go, to Joshua, he and his buddy Caleb, they're ready to go. But the rest of Israel wasn't, which is why they got stuck out in the desert for 40 years and why all of them died off during that time. So Israel is now comprised of the children of this faithless, grumbling generation of Israel. And now they have a new leader, Joshua. Now, do you know what his name means in the Old Testament Hebrew? It means 
Savior. So Joshua is the one who's going to save the people by bringing them into the promised land. Incidentally, do you know what the New Testament Greek word is for Savior? It's Jesus. That's what Jesus means, to save his people. And so Joshua is going to foreshadow Jesus in the New Testament as the Savior of the world. And there are tons of parallels in here. I'm sure you'll see them. And notice God is not asking here either. He's directing. When God says go, we got to move. It's almost as if God is saying, okay, Israel, your 40-year punishment is over. Now let's try this again. Go into the land that I promised. I'm not going to tolerate any more rebellion or disobedience. And notice, God doesn't even explain himself here. He just directs Joshua in one word, go over this Jordan River. The river connecting the Sea of Galilee in the north with the Dead Sea in the south. And they're going to cross that river en route to their first objective, Jericho. Of course, this directive is to both Joshua and to the people of Israel. They're to go into this land that God is giving them. So the land is going to be theirs because God is giving it to them. But it's occupied. So they won't just waltz in and take it. It's going to require effort. It's going to require struggle. There will be many battles. It's actually a principle that we're going to see all over the Bible because it describes our lives. Aren't our lives full of giants and battles and struggles and obstacles? But it's also a principle we see the way in which we confront this is through the middle voice. We keep seeing this all throughout Scripture. It's how our faith unfolds. God moves. He's going to give them land, and he gives them a directive, and then his people have to respond. They have to go. They have to take it. No, so no matter what challenges end up coming our way, and there will be many throughout the course of our everyday, ordinary lives, God will empower us, but we got to move. Now, this all may seem a little cold, a little harsh, a little bitter, one of those pointy parts in Scripture. I mean, after all, Moses is dead. Think about all the things he did. He screws up with this water thing, but he doesn't get to go into the promised land because of it. And then you think about all of these Israelites. They were homeless for 40 years while they watch all their parents die off. Then Joshua assumes command, and God says, go. Go take out these giants immediately. But that's why it's so important that we look through the directness of this text to see the heart behind it. Because it's not cold. It's not punitive. It actually reveals God's great love and his great affection for his people. He's always had it. There's just always going to be tough times. It's a result of the curse back at the fall. In fact, what we're going to see here, this graph up here kind of shows us the land that God had promised Abraham some 400 years prior. So God had been with his people, liberating them from captivity, sustaining them in the desert, all because he had made a promise centuries before that he would give Abraham's descendants this amazing land. And he did that simply out of an abundance of his steadfast love. That's the language we keep seeing here. You see, God has zeal for his beloved children. And we see it here as he describes this to Joshua. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. Meaning, you will not fall, Joshua. This phrase, have given, is in the present perfect. So it's a done deal. It's going to happen. So every step Joshua takes will be a successful step because God has already foreordained it. Why? Because he promised. It says, just as I promised to Moses, that you'd be the guy that's going to take these beloved children of mine into this land. You see, this is exactly the same land that God had promised Abraham and Jacob, Isaac, all of them. It says right here, from the wilderness, that's the south part, and the Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, that's what you see up on the east, all the land of the Hittites, that's up on the north, to the great sea toward the going down of the sun on the west shall be your territory. So this is God fulfilling his promise to Abraham centuries before. You see, God's steadfast love is enduring. 
He has great affection for his people. He has zeal for them. He loves his children. And he's been with them for centuries now, leading them, sustaining them, and protecting them. And then we come to even more words of comfort that God gives to Joshua. He says, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. No man, even those superhuman Anakite giants, are going to be able to stand before you. Not just now, but all the days of your life. And I hope you hear that, because that's the same thing he's saying to us. What an encouragement that must have been to Joshua. Doesn't matter how big they are, how smart they are, how many of them there are, I will stand with you until the end. Do you see how much God loves Joshua? But there's even more. Look at what God says next. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. In fact, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's a word that Joshua probably needed to hear, and that's a word that we need to hear this morning as well. That God is with us, even to the end of the age. That's what Jesus promises us in this great commission, that bottom slice of bread we keep talking about. So it's the same promise that God had made to Moses. It's the same promise that God makes right here to Joshua. We need not fear anyone or anything because God is not only on our side, he's at our side. He's with us. He's actually now in us. Now that's a pretty big encouragement, I hope. So do you know that? Do you know that about yourself? If you've been born again to a new life in Christ, that God is actually in you every single minute of every single day. If we just had an awareness of that, can you imagine what would change in our lives? They would change indeed from everyday ordinary to everyday extraordinary. That no matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter how you feel on any given day, he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. And we know this to be true and trustworthy simply because God said it. These are his words. He's the author of truth. Whatever he says, it always happens. So we can take comfort in this. We can trust him. Now, I'll be honest. If I was Joshua, I don't like my chances against those Anakite giants up there. However, if Almighty God is with me, the creator and sustainer of the universe, then think about it. Who really stands a chance against me? Do you remember what Caleb said? Back in Numbers, he said, those giants will be bread for us. In other words, we're going to eat them alive. That's what good courage is all about. That's the mindset that we all need to have here at Four Mile. Not because of our strength, but simply because God promises to be with us. And then God reminds Joshua of something he told him some 40 years earlier when he was a spy. You'll recall this was the four-part order he got. Go into the Negev and the hill country. See the land, the people, and the cities. Be of good courage. And of course, bring back some of the fruit of the land so everybody get a chance to see it. But back then, Israel wasn't of good courage. They grumbled. They rebelled. They were disobedient. Except Caleb and Joshua. And God appears now to be reminding Joshua of what he told him 40 years before. That he used to be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. In other words, be of good courage. It's the same thing he told them before. Just like you were back then, because I'm not just giving you some vacant land you're going to waltz in on. No, the land is going to require struggle. It is not going to be easy. Make no mistake about it, those giants are everywhere. But I will be with you every single step of the way. But now, you're going to have to go do something. You're going to have to respond to me. You're going to have to be strong, and you're going to have to be courageous. You're going to have to have faith. Believe in me, and then behave in step with it is you profess to believe. And that's the mindset we're called to have. Do we have that faith? Do we have that belief in who God is? And then the behavior, the courage to carry out what it is that we say we believe. Strong and courageous. 
And this is not just physically strong and courageous either, just charging blindly into this land of giants. No, there's a great deal more to the type of courage God has in mind here. So God explains it. He says, only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. So you see, in some sense, Israel didn't actually leave Moses behind. They might have done so physically, but this law that they brought with them, it contained his writings. So he was there with them. And while this law, which Moses recorded, could not save Israel, it would absolutely guide them. And this is such an important point for us to grasp this morning. So focus in here. The law does not save us. Our obedience is not what saves us. But it does show us how it is that we're to respond to our loving God with good courage. So it's absolutely vital that we're obedient to it. You see, a strong, a bold, a firm, a prevailing mindset comes from our devotion to God. That's what we see right here. Devotion to His Word. To do things His way. And we know this to be true because obedience is how we actually show God that we love him. Jesus told us that in John 14. If you love me, you will obey my commands. You see, Scripture shows us the way God designed things to work. That's why we got to read it. Things happen according to his word. It's how he made them to happen. So being of good courage means that we're very careful to do things the way God designed them. And that's in a very specific way. Because next God says, do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left hand, that you may have good success wherever you go. So you see, we can't take liberties with God's law, where we take some parts and we disregard others. No, God actually makes it clear that we can't turn from the right or from the left. We have to stay focused on exactly what he tells us. But if we follow it to a T, then we'll actually be in step with Almighty God and how he designed things to be. So we'll have good success wherever we go and whatever we do. Now that does not mean that our lives will be full of unicorns and rainbows all the time. This is not a prosperity message. Too many people twist this around the wrong way. Things are gonna be hard. Make no mistake about it. They're battling giants after all, but they'll ultimately be successful. And if you think about our lives, what are the giants in our lives? Well, they're our marriages, they're parenting, our bosses, work, all the struggle that we have in our everyday ordinary life. That's what we're talking about here. It's hard, but here's the thing. We got to be of good courage. We battle through because when we get on the other side of whatever it is, it's an amazing amount of success that we get to experience as God tells us. Far too often our itchy ears want to hear that God is there to make our lives easy and to make our lives happy, but there's nothing further from the truth than that. We don't find that message anywhere in Scripture. Look at what Israel's children went through, homeless for 40 years, while they're watching their parents die off. You see, things don't always unfold according to the way we want them to, but they will always unfold according to the way God designs them to unfold. He is sovereign over all. He desires to save us, but it's going to happen His way. And sometimes that means going through some really tough stuff. And if you think about it, most of that tough stuff is usually either because of our sin or because of somebody else's sin around us. So the trick here, what we're to take away from this, is that we simply must know God's way, inside and out. Because next God says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. And that's why we just can't open our Bibles every now and then, or whenever we get around to it. Because if we want to know the truth, we got to get in this thing. We must get it in us, so that what comes out of us, our words, are actually His words. So we're to meditate on it day and night. That means continually, always, every single chance we get. So we want to be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Not just the stuff we like, but all of it. For then we'll make, he'll make our way prosperous with good success. 
It doesn't necessarily make our situations or our life easier at all, but it shows us how to respond in light of whatever tough situation we're up against right now. Because that's how God designed this universe to work. When we do things His way, they work out. And that's simply because that's the way He designed it. And then God closes His charge with what's undoubtedly the greatest comfort we could ever find. He says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So God commands Joshua to be strong and courageous, of good courage. He reminds him yet one more time. That means don't ever waver in your devotion to God. No matter what comes your way, never fear, never be dismayed. Be strong and courageous. Why? For the Lord your God, not just any God, but your God, your personal loving God. He's with you wherever you go. You see, we tend to go with, we hang out with, we want to be in the presence with the people that we love in life. And that's why God's choice of desiring to be with us is his way of expressing to us that he loves us, that he has zeal for us, that he's actually madly in love with us. He created you. He sustains you. He desires to prosper and to save you, but not with material wealth and ease, but rather by we being with you wherever it is that you go. When you're in the highlands of life and the sun is shining, when you're in those valleys and those shadows because the thick clouds are overhead, or when you're facing those giants in your life, he's with you always. So Joshua had nothing to fear, and neither do we. Because Jesus reaffirms this very truth. We read it over and over again. It's those exact same words that God gave to Joshua. Don't ever forget that bottom slice of bread. Behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. What an amazing comfort. It's actually overwhelming when you think about it. I know many times after a service as we're reading this together, I can barely mouth those words because it's just overwhelming to know that God is with us to the end of the age. He's never going to forsake us. He's never going to leave us. What a comfort to know that you are loved, that God is madly in love with you. He has zeal for you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for your word. We thank you that you promise to be with us always, to the end of the age. Lord, we so desire to walk in your ways, to follow your path, not turning to the right or to the left, because we desire to glorify you in every single thing that we do. Lord, the days are often long, they're often hard. We're weary, we fall behind, but with your strength, with your presence, we have exactly what we need to do the next right thing, So please make us of good courage to the praise and honor of your mighty name. For Jesus' sake, amen. 